Well, hello there, P2P workshop participants. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ginny Rodrigo, and I'm the Settlement Best Practices Coordinator for the Success Settlement and Family Services Immigrant Settlement and Integration Program. I will be your moderator for today, and I would like to acknowledge that our Success Head Office is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples in particular the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations. I would also like to personally extend my gratitude to the many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island who continue to inspire and teach us through their rich, diverse cultures and their powerful resilience. Your presenters today during the next hour are Peggy Lau, Program Director from the Success Settlement and Family Services. Shay Viswanathan, Associate Program Director, and Callisto Madzingwa, Language Best Practices Coordinator. They'll be speaking with you and we'll do our best to leave 15 minutes or so at the end of their presentation to address any questions that you might have. Uh, you'll notice that in your uh, uh, presentation there, uh, you have a Q&A section. And as we go, I invite you to type in questions as they occur to you. And if you notice that someone else has asked a question and you'd like that to be answered as well, you can even vote for it to bump it up. And um, we'll, we'll try to adjust as many as we can. I'll be supporting my colleagues to field your questions and we will do our best to answer them at the end of all three of the presentations. At the very end of our slides, we'll have our contact information for Peggy, Shay, and Callisto, and you are very welcome to follow up with them in the future. So before they dive in, next, next slide, please. We would just like to share a little bit about success with you in case you haven't heard of us before. Since 1973, Success has dedicated itself to helping newcomers achieve their full potential. What began as a basic wish to help newcomers overcome barriers and get settled in British Columbia has evolved into an international social service agency that assists more than 70,000 clients annually. Today, across our 30 service locations in Canada and three offices in Asia, we provide newcomer settlement, employment, community development, language training, family and youth counseling, affordable housing and seniors care services. Our deep partnerships with government, community organizations and the public have enabled us to become a voice in the community, as well as an advocate for diversity, inclusion and civic engagement. Our vision is one of a vibrant Canadian society where people thrive and contribute to inclusive communities. And our mission is to empower people on their Canadian journey to achieve their goals through services and advocacy that promote belonging, wellness, and independence. Our settlement and family services specifically provide a wide range of services to newcomers, including the IRCC funded Action Commitment and Transformation Program and the Immigrant Settlement and Integration Program and programming from other funding sources. Next slide, please. I'd like to invite Peggy Lau, our Program Director of Settlement and Family Services at Success to start us off by sharing some thoughts about responding to the pandemic with resilience. Some uh, thoughts that we'd like to share with you and some emerging practices we've come to explore as we have navigated settlement service delivery in the past year. It is my honor to present to you, Peggy Lau. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Peggy. I'm the program director at SSS settlement and family services. If you are here in the settlement sector, then I think I can safely say that we have had a pretty good taste and a parallel understanding on what we have been facing this year, this past year in particular, and what you are continuing to face this year. 
one could argue that there is no such a thing as best practices in this situation. So what we have come to say is that in this changing landscape is that we might be able to identify some emerging practices and I'd like to invite you today to take a step back with us from your busy schedule to consider with us the following emerging, uh, emerging practices we have of serve in our settlement service delivery during this uh, period of time. So let's reflect on this aspect in the hope that they might be uh, of some use to you as well as you continue to find ways to be to best serve your clients. And just a disclaimer here, um, this is obviously not the final say in the conversation. Um, this is only the beginning of the conversation we are continuing to have in the settlement sector as we witness what has been emerging so far. So what we soon discover was that focusing on aspect of communication, support, and consciously finding ways to build internal community and resilience that has made all the difference for all our staff and our clients. So let's unpack each of these four points in more details. So the first point, communication, establish a new communication strategy. So this point I'd like to share with you this morning may sound simple enough, but it became a paramount important during the first wave of the pandemic and has only gotten stronger we have to establish a new communication strategy to communicate with our team and also with the clients that we work with. It is not enough to say that, however, we need to stay connected with our team virtually. We have to go through a whole process of identifying and troubleshooting what kind of remote support was needed for each individual team member. So this meant we also had to have the right tools in order to check in with our staff, both formally and informally. Navigating technology such as Microsoft Teams, Zoom and Moodoo became essential in this process and establishing internet connectivity was a, significant, uh, was a significant challenge for some of our staff who shift to working remotely uh, from home. Consciously integrating informal opportunity for staff to interact and socialize safely ensure that we may have been distant from each other, but certainly not disengaged, which was so important for staff over um, for the overall mental health and wellness. Something really important to keep in mind here is that professional boundary and confidentiality must be maintained while serving clients remotely. And I'm certain that all of our colleagues across Canada in the settlement sector have realized by now that new protocol have had to be in place in this regard. This has also meant that staff need to be provided with thorough training and resources and tools to learn and review this emerging protocol and procedures. And quite simply, we cannot forget that consent for service is not just a tick box in the consent form. It is still required to be informed consent. A new strategy had to be put in place to ensure that this continued to happen. Of course, all of this meant that one's leadership, no matter what one's style um, is, out of necessity needs to include flexibility and adaptability. So for all of my colleagues in the settlement sector out there, who are leaders. This does not mean we need to be perfect. We must balance compassion as we continue to strive for excellence, and that might even mean that we include acknowledging our own vulnerability while we lead with empathy. It is important to collaborate with staff about existing or new accommodation needs and really try to work with them as best as we can to listen and provide support. As, as a leader, I encourage all of us to keep our senses alert to recognize red flags and often low impact debriefing for staff who are overwhelmed. This is a very tough one for all of us, but it is very important for us to not only respect staff hours, but also the needs for break in order to foster and, uh, and model mental um, healthy boundary. 
So on a practical level, we have observed that we have needed to review and modify service plan informed by our staff who have collaborated with us closely in providing ongoing feedback on what is working and what needs to be tweaked. So more than ever, it, is, uh, it has been increasingly important to notice that our direct reports really can raise up and respond to the challenges when we can ensure that we keep them up to date on the latest development and that includes many things as well as practical pieces like important deadline with an advance notice as possible and with gentle reminders. Speaking of practical pieces, I think we have all realized that situational leadership is really important and each staff person may have different needs. That is why it is so important to notice when staff need more time to adapt to new technology in order to work remotely. This idea um, dovetail into um, a larger piece regarding communi community and developing a strong internal support network amongst team. As I mentioned before, it is important to take the time to, to provide low impact debrief opportunity for staff and it is not all on you as leader. When appropriate and where is still maintaining professional boundary encourage peer support and mentorship opportunity as much as possible within your staff team. If your agency has an employee assistant program, have contact information handy to remind staff on, of this and other of community support if they are feeling overwhelmed. While we have um, struggled with ways of overwhelm during the pandemic, and we will continue to do so, I have been touched and moved by the incredible resilience of the client that we served, despite those challenges. And in particular, I have been inspired by my colleagues and my frontline uh, settlement staff who have continued to provide outstanding service as they have navigated this unprecedented times. We're working together in our leadership teams to incorporate as best as we can a supportive, trauma-informed, supportive work environment that has extended to a virtual work environment. In the fall of 2019, myself and some of my leadership team member had the opportunity to attend a building a trauma-informed organization workshop at the Justice Institute um, of BC facilitated by the renowned trauma-informed practice special, specialist Nancy Poole. We continue to slowly learn and try to incorporate some of her incredible resources. And during the pandemic, more than ever, we have seen the benefit of some simple step to lead with kindness and compassion, and in particular, fry, strive to foster a culture of open collaboration communications. I recommend researching how to consciously make a point of fostering a climate of respect in which all staff feel safe to share new ideas. And quite simply, don't forget to thank them. It is amazing how well deserved and specific praise of what someone did right goes a long way. And in that spirit, before I pass it on to um, our associate program director, I leave you to consider how you might find ways to juggle your busy schedule and yet take the time to consciously demonstrate authentic empathy and be available to your team. In this difficult time, it is important as leader for us to take into account that impact of isolation, loneliness, as well as extraordinary additional staff family commitments be aware of the changes we, might no we may notice in our team ability to cope. I encourage you to find ways to share ideas and promote work-life balance with your team. I now pass it on to my colleague to talk about planning a settlement service office return after working remotely. Over to you, Shay. Thank you, Peggy, and hello, everyone. To help guide and support this reopening process for each of our regional offices, our organization created a centralized return to work task force committee. This committee was made up of representatives
representatives from our human resources and facilities departments, as well as Success's executive management team. Members of this committee reached out to regional teams of staff for suggestions and feedback on identifying several aspects around health and safety settlement service delivery to clients and concerns in returning to the workplace for consideration. This information along with all of the new provincial workplace health and safety protocols were incorporated to develop new return to work operational policies, human resource policies, risk assessment planning tools, return to work safety uh, planning templates, and return to work guidelines for all of our employees, clients, and visitors in order to ensure a safe and smooth reopening for all of our office locations. Next slide, please. To aid in the planning of settlement services to resume in office, a comprehensive checklist of items was provided by our centralized committee. Regional teams provided diagrams of entire office spaces highlighting all floor plan measurements to clearly indicate two meter physical distancing that could be maintained for both staff and clients. Diagrams also included maximum number of people that could be accommodated in each room with new configuration of tables and chairs and placement of plexiglass barriers in reception areas and interview rooms where client appointments would take place. These floor plan diagrams proved to be especially useful as a reference material for the centralized committee during final walkthroughs and also as a learning tool for training purposes to all staff just prior to reopening. A COVID-19 health and safety guideline for staff and a separate guideline for clients were also created. Once all regional office safety plans and the physical spaces were made ready, it was then time to submit all newly created documentation to the centralized committee and then set up a time for a virtual office inspection for a final approval before finally allowing staff to return to the office to resume in-person client services. Next slide. Once our centralized task force had completed developing these policies and guidelines, each of our regional offices were then notified and given the green light to start working on customizing regional return to work COVID-19 safety plans and risk assessments. The next step was to start preparing each regional office space by conducting physical walkthroughs to identify potential safety hazards and determine what physical modifications were needed to make each office location in compliance with the new occupational health and safety protocols outlined by our Provincial Workers' Compensation Board in British Columbia, known as WorkSafe BC. Examples of this included cordoning off of specific areas to create enough space for physical distancing, the installation of plexiglass, the removal and storage of furnishings and paper records, just to name a few. Revisiting janitorial contracts and increasing services for daily enhanced cleaning service was need, services was needed, along with connecting with property management landlords to inquire about their reopening protocols, such as physical distancing measures in shared common areas like elevators, washrooms, stairwells, and lobby areas, and asking them to share their plan with us. Other steps included the costing out of purchase and purchasing of, cl of cleaning and disinfectant supplies, PPE materials required for inside the office for employees and clients to use during in-person services. Next slide, please. As a prelude to reopening, there was still a lot of preparation to do in terms of multilingual signage for new, um, sorry, in terms of multilingual signage new forms for clients and staff, new procedures still to produce and put into place. Some examples of this uh, are occupancy limit and cleaning signage for all rooms, hallways, kitchen areas, signage from the Health Authority and WorkSafe BC to name a few. All screening forms, consent forms and health and safety guidelines for clients were made available in multiple languages, such as Arabic, Farsi, Punjabi, Tagalog, traditional and simplified Chinese, Korean and English. 
a return to office schedule was also needed to be created for staff as teams would be split into two. They would be alternating between working from home and working from the office every two weeks. Splitting the team into two smaller teams was done so as not to cross contaminate the whole team. Should there have been an outbreak of COVID-19 amongst one team, it would not affect the other team who could still continue to provide in-person services while the other, other team would remain at home to quarantine for two weeks. A new appointment and room scheduling template was also created for booking clients um, in for in-person services that followed a staggered schedule to provide adequate time for cleaning and disinfecting uh, to be done in between appointments and to also ensure the occupancy limit never exceeded at any given time. The development of new procedures also included new cleaning and disinfecting protocols and procedural flowcharts. Uh, three different procedural flowcharts were created to help staff to refer to as an easy to read visual diagram detailing the various processes staff needed to follow and the forms that they needed to use during these processes, like how to book in per, in person service appointments with clients, what to do when a client arrives for an in person service and procedures for staff when working out of the office. Providing multilingual forms uh, and signage, as well as guidelines, all contributed to a very smooth transition back to the office, and it allowed regional management teams to communicate out new protocols in advance to staff and clients, and it helped many people feel more comfortable and included as part of this process that led up to the eventual office reopening. Next slide, please. So regular... Regular and transport, transparent communication with regional teams was key and an integral part of providing training and support to staff from beginning to end of this transition process of returning back to the office and resuming in-person services in a very new way. Regular individual check-ins and virtual team discussions took place over the course of the preparation and planning stages. And once the regional offices received approval to reopen, staff members were given training orientations of the office safety plan and staff guidelines virtually in a team meeting setting, and then followed up by an on-site orientation where staff had the opportunity to practice entering the office and learning how to let clients into the office while also providing feedback about this entire experience to their regional management teams. And as a follow-up piece, some video scenarios were also created for staff to refer to online. Some examples of video scenarios uh, that were provided were um, what to say when a client drops in without an appointment or what to do when a client arrives too early before an appointment time. Overall, transitioning back to the office and resuming in-person services was a fairly smooth and positive experience for all staff and clients so far. Next, I'd like to invite Kalisto Madzingwa, our Language Training Services Best Practices Coordinator for our from our Immigrant Settlement and Integration Program to share some of his insights about how our organization maximized the use of technology to support newcomer language profici proficiencies this past year. Kalisto. Uh, thank you very much, Shay. Um, so like uh, what my colleague said, I will be talking about the language training part um, at success. Um, as all of you, or most of you have experienced, it was a difficult and challenging year for most organizations that offer settlement services and language training as well. So it was a time for us to pivot from face-to-face -face classes to online classes. Uh, next, please. So just to give you a, a, a bit of a background um, about success and our, lane, uh, our language training program, uh, pre-COVID, we had 114 classes and uh, all these classes were face-to-face. -face. Some of them were blended, but still, so the blended classes, what it meant is they had to do part of the classes face-to-face -face and part of the classes online 
using our model. So what it meant for us was to pivot from that delivery mode to Zoom and Moodle. We, fortunately, we already had a robust Moodle system for our blended classes and also for our curriculum, which was a repository for our curriculum. And uh, pre-COVID, more than 75% of our teachers had already completed Learn IT to Teach. We really promoted and pushed for teachers to do Learn IT to Teach, learn IT to teach pre-COVID. So what we did uh, as part of our pivoting from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning was to put teachers in teams so that they could create content for the different levels and uh, post the content on Moodle so that it would be ready for all the teachers to use. And remarkably, I would like to say within three weeks, most of the classes were up and running online. Next, please. So I will talk a little bit about uh, our students and their proficiency and comfort level with our technology. So I could divide the groups into the students into three groups, depending on their uh, proficiency level, comfort level with technology. So the first group was, um, is a group that I would call students who were familiar with blended learning. Remember I mentioned that we had some blended classes. And the second category is uh, a category of students who were unfamiliar with any online learning. They'd never taken a blended class. They may have seen videos in class, watched movies, or the teacher could have asked them to do an internet search, but that's not what is required or was demanded of them to go to do online learning. And then the third category is literacy and tech challenge students. So these were students who had to learn technology, and at the same time, they had very low literacy level. So these were the three categories of students that we were dealing with. Uh, next, please. So I will say a little bit more about students with literacy challenges and lower zero B level students, uh, and how we supported them. And uh, when we pivoted from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to online, their comfort level with technology as well. Um, I think it's fair to say that within the language training organization, there was this misconception pre-COVID that lower level students could not handle technology. In other words, people thought that lower level students could not do online learning. I think this is, it's fair to say this was common amongst our language training organizations. But the reality that we found out at success is that with the appropriate level of support and the type of technology that is available to them, they could handle technology and they could do online learning as well. We also found out that with the right support students were able to navigate the various devices that they were using. Some of the students were using phones to join Zoom sessions, for example. Some of them were using tablets. Some of them were using uh, computers. It could be a desktop or a laptop. And we also found out uh, through surveys that we did that Zoom sessions were really popular, even with the lower level students. They really enjoyed the Zoom sessions. They actively participated uh, during the Zoom sessions. Maybe it was uh, a chance for them to show off to their family members that first, they can use technology, and second, that they were also enjoying and learning uh, English. What we found out was that Moodle was really, really challenging for the students, for the lower level students. It was a steep learning curve for them. So, we did surveys and they indicated that Zoom was really challenging. And even the teachers, they mentioned that it was hard for the students to navigate Zoom to do activities on, sorry, to do activities on Moodle. One other thing that uh, um, 
aspect that uh, of technology that we required of our students was to have emails because for them to register for on our Moodle platform, they required emails. Some of the students, the lower level students, they didn't have email pre-COVID. So they had to be taught how to create an email, how to have a password, how to remember their passwords, they had to write their passwords down somewhere. But still we found out that they managed this because they could log in to Moodle to do the different activities. And next please. So I've talked about students. I will say a little bit about uh, the instructors or the teachers. So just like uh, the students, the teachers also had varying degrees of competence with technology. So pre-pandemic, there were teachers who had developed tech skills and had blended learning, blended teaching experience. Uh, remember earlier on, I mentioned that we encouraged our teachers to take learn IT to teach. And some of them had uh, the stage four, the highest stage. Some were at stage three with learn IT to teach. Some were at stage two. And then the second group of teachers in terms of uh, tech abilities or proficiency were teachers who had limited, limited tech skills, but they were very open to learning. They, were receptive to learning new technology and they were willing to do that. And then the third category of teachers are teachers who had limited tech skills and they were hesitant about technology. I, 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 I think it would be fair to say in all language training organizations, the teachers could be categorized into the, the teachers fall into these three different categories in terms of tech abilities. So, at success, what we did was to support all the teachers, regardless of the tech abilities that they demonstrated or that they had pre-COVID. So we responded by offering language instructors constant support and training. So next, I will say a little bit more about how we did that. Next, please. So I will say in, a little bit more detail, the support that we offered our language instructors. So the first thing that we did was to set up a weekly drop-in text session to increase digital skills amongst our teachers. So every Friday, we had two drop-in sessions, one in the morning and the other one in the afternoon. We chose Friday because most of our classes run from Monday to Thursday. So on Fridays, our teachers have time to had time to attend the tech sessions. And during these tech sessions, we didn't make it compulsory, we made it voluntary because we wanted the teachers to come willingly so that they could learn more. We also encouraged our teachers to continue to make use of free external training, such as Learn IT to Teach, to Taylor, AMSA, BCTIL. These organizations, they offered wonderful, wonderful external training sessions, webinars, they streamed the videos. So we encouraged our teachers to take advantage of that and increase their tech abilities. What we also did at Success was we created our own internal videos. We streamed our own videos and we posted them on Moodle. The videos were created by some of the teachers who had uh, high tech abilities, uh, some of the administrators, and uh, they were very popular with teachers because they focused on specific topics. For example, a video could just focus on how to import content to Moodle. A video could focus on, uh, for example, how to create a particular quiz, maybe a, a true or false quiz or a, uh, fill in the gap quiz or a multiple choice quiz. So these videos were short and were very specific and they were very popular with our teachers. So the other thing that we did to support our teachers was uh, to during our professional development days, which we had pre-COVID was to focus more on the use of technology. 
for example, we would invite guest speakers to talk about the different platforms that are out there for teachers to use. And we also made sure that the teachers had a chance to share amongst themselves uh, the type of technology that they're using, the challenges, and how they overcome those challenges in their classes. For example, we would have uh, teachers in level specific groups. For example, teachers who teach lower levels like link one or link two would meet as a group, share the challenges, share how they overcome those challenges, and then we would develop that into a document and then share it amongst all the teachers at success. And next, please. So the language, the support for our language instructors also included teachers only forums and groups. We felt that it was important for us to create a safe space for teachers where administrators would not be part of these forums because we thought that some of the teachers would feel kind of judged by the, uh, the administrators. So we thought it would be safe for the teachers to create their own forums, share information amongst themselves without the administrators moderating or being involved in those particular groups. And we also encouraged peer tutoring. This would be tutoring uh, amongst themselves, the teachers, without the administrators being involved. And there were so many teachers who were willing to share what they already know, those who had done Learn IT to teach and who were willing to tutor their own peers. And then, like I mentioned before, we had also level specific teams where we created these uh, teams on, uh, on teams, uh, please pardon the pun, on the platform teams so that teachers could interact almost in real time. For example, teachers who may have a problem would send uh, uh, an SOS, a request for assistance on Teams, and then other teachers who are knowledgeable about that problem or who know how to solve that problem could troubleshoot with the teacher uh, in real time. So this was also very popular amongst our teachers because they didn't feel isolated. They realized that they had so much support at different levels and on different platforms. So this was also very helpful for our teachers, especially those teachers who were a little bit hesitant about the use of technology. Uh, next, please. So in all this, uh, what was the administrator's role? So the administrators, as you may all be aware, we were moving from a face-to-face delivery mode to an online platform, which is different. So the administrators had to come up with clear protocols and guidelines for teachers and students on how to learn uh, on um, a different platform. For the teachers also, how to teach on a different platform. Uh, guidelines on, for example, attendance. Uh, guidelines on um, how to manage their own classrooms. So the administrators have to come up with these protocols to guide the teachers and also to guide the students because this was an uncharted territory for us before the pandemic to have 100% online classes for all our classes at success. And also the administrators had to make adjustments to our own policies to reflect the online learning environment. And lastly, the administra administrators had to develop pedagogical guidelines on teaching online. So it's one thing to create uh, these um, guidelines, the administrative guidelines, for example, on how to take attendance and uh, different from how to teach online. For example, the administrators had to develop guidelines on how classroom management. How do you manage a class online? How do you develop interactive uh, lessons online? These were the pedagogical guidelines that uh, we came up with for our teachers. How do you make an interactive lesson? How do you 
make sure that the students are engaged for the entire duration of the online class. These are some of the guidelines that the administrators came up with for our teachers. Next, please. So in all this, maybe the more interesting questions for language training organizations is what are the implications for the future? Uh, I think it would be safe to say that online learning is here to stay. People have experimented with online learning. We're not the only organization that is uh, uh, pivoted to online learning. And people have seen that online learning, it works. It has its own challenges, but it has its own merits as well. So it's safe to say it's here to stay. Um, since online learning is here to stay, the other implication is that online teaching for teachers becomes a core competency. Pre-COVID, being able to teach online was a peripheral skill. And if you looked at job postings, pre-COVID, online learning was mentioned as being preferred. Uh, it was mentioned as an added advantage. It was mentioned as an asset. But if you look at uh, the job postings that are currently being uh, posted right now, you will see that online learning is mentioned as being required. That's why I'm saying it becomes a core competence for teachers. And the other implication here is that uh, colleges, universities, and organizations that offer language training to ESL instructors maybe should build in the language, the online language training so that the teachers who come out of these colleges are ready and have the skills to be able to teach online, whether they're using Zoom, whether they're using Microsoft Teams, uh, whether they're doing this on Moodle, whatever online platform or learning management system that they're going to use. This becomes a prerequisite for the teachers who are coming out of the colleges. Another implication is that in-person learning is still preferred, especially for the lower levels uh, and for the literacy classes. So what it means is, Despite the in-person mode of delivery being preferred, the, these students, they also need to learn computers because as they progress to the next levels, they may find out that, that they have to transition from a face-to-face -face class to an online class. For example, a student who may be doing link three, when they transition or when they progress to the next level, maybe link four or five, they may find that the classes that are mostly available will be online or blended. So that means even for the lower levels, it's still important to teach them the tech skills, even if they're not doing online learning. Another implication is that um, regardless of the CLB level, the development of tech skills is, has become part of language learning. Pre-COVID, language learning was uh, a separate uh, activity and te learning tech skills was a separate activity. What, is, what uh, the pandemic has done is to bring the two together. Language learning and uh, learning uh, tech abilities, digital literacy, they've become embedded or intertwined. You cannot separate one from the other. It's really difficult. So. What it means is language learning has become or requires or includes now digital or technical learning. The two are almost inseparable, in my opinion. Uh, next, please. So in terms of delivery modes for language teaching, another implication is that now we have a wider variety for our clients to choose from. We have in-person, which has been very traditional, and we have online instructor-led, and then we have online self-directed 
And then we have self-directed self via uh, correspondence. So I will say a little bit more about uh, the online. So the online instructor-led is what has been traditionally called the blended learning, whereby the students have a teacher who is teaching them and who is guiding them through. But what we have also seen during the pandemic is online self-directed, where students, particularly at higher levels, were able to do self-paced learning, learning on their own with very minimal guidance from the instructor. And then the third, the last one, the self-directed via correspondence is almost similar to the link home study, whereby the students receive the learning packages through, um, through email. And we have seen that some organizations have also used the self-directed via correspondence where students have homework packages being sent to them via email, and they also respond to the, the they give, they, they do their homework, send their responses, responses to the teacher via email as well. So the implication here is that the clients have a wider choice in terms of the delivery of link or language instruction whether they choose to do that in person or online instructor led or they choose to do the online self directed or whether they do they choose to do the self directed via correspondence so this is a good thing it's good in that the students now have a wider choice for them to choose in terms of which delivery mode they prefer next please So continuing with the implications for the future, um, one of the challenges with online learning, which has been, uh, which has dogged online learning for a long time, is the validity, especially in terms of the assessments. We, through our own experience, we realized that some of the students, for example, who joined the classes are uh, using a phone or an iPhone, it was hard for them, for example, to turn on their videos or their cameras. So imagine the students doing an assessment and their video is off. It's really challenging to tell whether they're getting assistance or they're doing it themselves. This is a challenge that continues to be faced by all the language training organizations that provide online learning. How do we know that it is our student who is doing the assessment? Or how do we know that it is our student who is doing the work without getting assistance from family members? This is a problem and a challenge. Uh, the other uh, challenge related to the validity of assessment is that even external uh, assessments, for example, language placement assessments, they're also being conducted online. And I am assuming that they may also face similar challenges in terms of validity. How do they know that it is the client who is doing the assessment? Or how do we know that it is the client who is doing the assessment without getting assistance? For example, I have seen that when I went to the CCLB website or the government website, they mentioned that there were placement assessments that were done with the absence of a proctor. That means nobody, nobody is invigilating the student or the client who is taking that exam. And also there's online self-assessment as well for placement tests. So the same question arises, how do we know that the client is doing the assessment without getting assistance? Maybe a good thing may come out of these uh, validity uh, issues or validity questions. We may have eventually people developing honesty and integrity in such a way that they will take the exam on their own without getting assistance, even if there's nobody who is supervising them, even if their videos are turned off, even if their cameras are turned off. So I'm optimistic that this may develop 
a culture of honesty and integrity amongst our students or amongst our clients. And I see this as a silver lining to the problem of validity and uh, you know, of these uh, assessments and uh, online learning. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Callisto, Shay, and Peggy for sharing today. Uh, we're now moving to a question and answer portion and I will be fielding some questions. We have quite a few really interesting questions in the uh, Q&A section and I'll um, post them to a panelist and then I will uh, take the opportunity once that panelist has addressed the question to ask the other panelists if uh, they have anything that they'd also like to add. So for the first question, Callisto, I think I will um, pose it to you first. Uh, it's the first one I see that's got the most uh, thumbs up in the chat there, um, in the, sorry, the Q&A section. Uh, and it says language instruction is about more than language per se. It is also about forming social connections, learning Canadian way of life, et cetera. How can you do this online? Isn't this missing the larger point? Thank you very much for the question. So, uh, yes, so we can also form communities online. So maybe it's something that we, I should have mentioned. We have online communities. We have uh, people sharing uh, online. Uh, we have uh, people interacting online. Of course, it doesn't replace uh, the in-person um, uh, experience, but also learning about the Canadian culture. Students or clients, they also did uh, virtual field trips. For example, organizations offered, I, I know like um, uh, examples, uh, in organizations that offer recycling, they would offer virtual tours for our students so that they would actually in the comfort of their own homes, they would actually go see how that particular facility recycles, how they sort out the recycling materials. So organizations, teachers have been very creative to make sure that that piece, the Canadian culture piece is not missed. Although of course it's different from, uh, from face to face or from visiting the actual facility, but it has been built in into most of the classes and the lessons as well. Thank you so much, Callisto. Um, Shay, would you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yes, um, I just wanted to add that we also had a group volunteering um, opportunities. Um, so basically how it worked was um, settlement workers would reach out to uh, a different um, uh, clientele that we were already in touch with and serving online and uh, let them know that they would be organizing volunteer opportunities. Uh, for example, uh, um, making little um, plants or, or doing gardening and, and actually making little plants um, for the seniors housing complex, um, a group of people. And what would happen is they would make their pot potted plants and drop them off at our office. And then we would then deliver them to a seniors housing complex. Um, and it was a lot of community building and a great contribution and it worked out very well. Um, others, other groups did uh, mask making and, and delivered them out. Um, but there were a lot of opportunities that, that were created during the pandemic, um, especially the first few months um, that um, brought the community together in a, in a different way. Um, there was another group that went out to a hospital and at 7 p.m. to just cheer the hospital workers on um, just across the street, we did a video and, and sent it to the hospital, I believe, um, things like that. So 
yeah, it was it was a unique a unique uh, way to reach out and and do community building in a different way. Thank you so much, Shay. Peggy, did you have anything you want to add, or would you prefer that I go to the next question? Um, just want to add on a little bit about what Callisto and Shay had sh uh, shared so far regarding the um, um, addressing the need of the, um, the newcomers. Um, doesn't matter their settlement clients or language student about um, social isolations. So this has been um, a challenge that we all faced uh, during last year of the past pandemic and um, it might happen it might continue to happen for a while longer so how what how we um, how the program um, has created a integration is because first of all our settlement program is integrated with our language training components so it's not running as a separate entity it's a same program in which that there's a lot of cross collaboration between um, clients uh, between our settlement clients and our students in terms of what type of activity they can join together so for example we, um, although there might not be a lot of opportunity for um, our teachers to be taking the student onto uh, physical field trips um, because of uh, physical distancing, but we have been providing a lot of virtual opportunity where clients can get together to um, continue to learn about um, their own community. And also within that um, um, programming, within the same division, there are also been um, support groups that we, our settlement practitioner and also our language instructor have been referring clients to, uh, to attend that based on the different settlement needs that they have. So this is um, a unique approach that um, um, not only success but uh, perhaps other organization has been using in the pandemic year and this will be continued to be um, 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 perhaps an approach for uh, for leading on to uh, for this year and, and years to come so I just want to add that low component in there as well. Thank you so much Peggy. I'll move to uh, another question. Um, I believe uh, we'll start with Callisto again for this one. Um, uh, you haven't said much about availability of technology to newcomers. How do you fill this gap that newcomers may not have access to computers or internet? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit challenging. Uh, maybe I will say a, a, a bit and then defer uh, to my program director. So it boils down to funding in terms of uh, buying computers for the clients, but I, I'll defer that to, uh, to my PD. What I can say is what we did was to support the clients in terms of whatever technology they may have at home. Like I said before, during my presentation, some of the students, they joined the Zoom classes using their phones. We helped them, we shared with them how they can do that. Some of the students uh, joined the classes using a tablet and we helped them how to navigate um, and how to be able to join the Zoom sessions or do Moodle activities using the tablet. Some of the students used laptops. Some of the students use desktops. So whatever type of technology that they had at home or devices, we tried as much as possible to support them so that they could join the classes using that, that the types of devices that were available to them. And also during the pandemic, what we discovered was that a family would share these devices. So, and students, were free to join a class. Remember, we had, I didn't mention this, but we have morning classes, afternoon classes, evening classes, and some classes on the weekends. So sometimes students would choose a particular time to attend a class when the device was free at home. For example, if they shared a computer with the son who would attend the class during the daytime, they would prefer to join an evening class so that they could use the same device. So I think the benefit uh, of all this was that a single device could be used by more than a more than, than more with could be used by a lot more members of the family than just one member because they could use it at different times. So it was easy to share. But in terms of buying uh, equipment for the students, 
I don't think that was feasible in terms of the budget. And that's why I said I can defer that question to my, my PD. Thank you so much, Calisto. Um, Peggy, would you like to add anything to that question? Well, this is a good, really good question. And um, uh, we, uh, we have been facing this challenge um, last year in terms of identifying enough resources to support the needs um, for computer and also internet. So um, we're starting with our baby steps right now. So we have been um, int we, uh, introducing um, uh, uh, tablets uh, where we have um, uh, identify resources to purchase a number of tablets uh, for our programs. And uh, we're going to be loaning the tablets to um, our clients who are attending, you know, our classes or different types of activity while they are with, uh, with, with the program. And this is one of the strategy is not, it, it's a band-aid solution, um, you know, to be quite frank, because um, uh, resources limited, but the demand is very big. So this is what we are uh, working on right now, introducing a tablet loan project, a program for those who are um, uh, uh, um, perhaps the most uh, vulnerable client groups that we work with. And also we'll be moving down to be like, you know, family unit and also uh, family with seniors because another non-language uh, non training related issues that we have been uh, trying to support is to <clears throat> increase the social connections uh, of our seniors client that we support um, to reduce their isolation. So introducing, um, you know, tablets, uh, supporting them on how to use it could uh, result in some benefit for increased engagement level. And also in um, the program this year, we have um, uh, settlement uh, workers who have been spending time with the clients and the students to support them to navigate uh, Zoom meetings. And in the beginning of the pandemic last year, we have conducted a number of um, workshops just to introduce how to use the technology and also uh, supporting like with Q&A sessions um, for the first few months. And also uh, we have um, an online service worker who uh, support the back end of our Moodoo and also help our students and also our language instructor to troubleshoot anything that is related to technology. So we have a navigator in in-house that supports all this um, uh, Q&A troubleshooting, but um, it's, not, it's not enough because like the demand is, is, is humongous and, and it's getting bigger because like the longer people um, stay at home um, um, isolated, the needs for technology and supports will, will, will continue to grow. So um, we have been continued to identify um, opportunity with different funding stores or partnerships um, to, uh, to get more technology um, for, uh, um, for, for loan to clients. So for example, we are partnering with um, we are in BC, so we're partnering with City of uh, Surrey to to, uh, to receive a number of uh, uh, notebook computers uh, for clients um, who reside in Surrey area uh, to for use for employment or language training purposes, and also we're working towards um, helping clients um, in in uh, in Surrey in the city of Surrey as well, getting like. Um, refurbished laptops and, and computer equipments, for example. So these are the opportunity that we will keep exploring um, and, and leverage as much as we can to help with, 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 with technology piece. Thank you so much, Peggy. I'll, I'll move on to a, a next question on top of the list here. And uh, Callisto, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna put you on the spot again and start with you first. Um, do you see online learning for newcomers as the main mode of instruction in the future? And then similar to the previous question in a way, how do you then overcome the lack of social interaction? In other words, the isolation that will become a big challenge. But the first part of that question is about um, how you see online learning for newcomers. Is it going to be the main mode of instruction in the future? Mm, okay, so thank you for the question. Um, as the main mode, I think it depends. So it depends on the level of education of uh, the learners. So I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that the newcomers, they are not a homogeneous group. So they come with varying skill, educa 
education levels, varying skill, technological skills, uh, varying language abilities. So I would say for the, high, the highly educated uh, immigrants, they may prefer, they may prefer to do online learning. And uh, the, those with low education, low literacy levels, low digital skills, they may, they may still prefer to have a face-to-face -face, uh, mode of delivery. And maybe what I could say in general about online learning, I think it's a phase. Um, people had their doubts about, about uh, online learning. People felt like online learning was different from face-to-face uh, -face learning. People felt like it was inferior in a way to face-to-face -face learning. It's only now that people are beginning to realize that there's actually no difference in terms of learning between online learning and face-to-face uh, -face, uh, learning. So as in the future, I think it will take a while for people to kind of get used to the idea that online learning is as equally good as face-to-face -face learning. So, and I would say it will take a while and I would say the divide between those who are highly educated and those who have uh, low education will still continue for a while with those who have higher education preferring maybe to do online learning because they can do independent learning. They, they want that autonomy to decide when they learn, where they can learn from, what time they learn, as opposed to those with low education with, who need a lot of hand holding, who need a lot of support in terms of their language learning and also in terms of their uh, tech abilities. So that divide, I think it will continue. And I think face-to-face -face will still be preferred uh, compared to uh, online learning. Uh, what was the second question, Ginny? May you repeat that? So for me? It, was, it was part of that question and sorry, it slipped to the next spot there. Um, so it was a about um, it, you know, considering that about possibly uh, taking more prominence, having more um, online learning as the main mode, then how would we overcome the lack of social interaction? And in other words, the isolation, that would be a big challenge. Mm. So um, I think the social isolation, I kind of addressed it. Uh, it was asked in, uh, in a previous question. Um, Teachers are very creative and uh, they found ways to engage the students. They found ways to build communities. And sometimes when we think about online learning, we think about somebody who is uh, in their own basement and they're just staring at the computer. They have nobody else to talk to. I mean, currently online learning also involves Zoom where just like what we're doing right now, we are presenting, I'm presenting in the comfort of my home, but I'm, I can, uh, there's a video on. Uh, and in the classroom, most of, most of the students will have their videos on, they can see each other, they can, they get to know each other at a more personal level as well. So there's that kind of interaction. Um, and if you think about learning, on Moodle, they have forums as well, where they can chat uh, sometimes in real time. So yes, the social isolation is there in terms of meeting physically, but not during the learning process where there's a class of students together with videos on, they can chat, they can make jokes. I, I, I know that like some of our teachers had uh, virtual potlucks, like during the end of uh, the term, they would have potlucks, each student is having food in their own home. Still, they get the sense of what a potluck is, for example, if you're looking at that cultural dimension. So you realize that, yes, there may be social isolation in terms of meeting physically, but in terms of 
being a community, I think we can build communities online and uh, people can also interact using the video, you know, the world developed now video platforms like Zoom and Microsoft Teams as well. I, I hope I've addressed the second part of the question. Thank you so much, Callisto. And um, I'm gonna move on because we only have a few more minutes left and there's several more questions that we'd like to um, uh, help to answer if possible. Uh, I see one from a dear friend, Jenny Lamb. Hi, Jenny. Uh, Jenny's asking us, uh, did you have to change the class size? And what is the number of students that can comfortably be managed in virtual classes? That's really interesting, you know, thinking about uh, the typical class side, class size, sorry, in person, um, and then um, thinking about what that is like, not just for the learners, but maybe even also for the language instructor. Um, what, I mean, it's just an emerging observation and maybe over time um, you might be able to observe better, but what does that feel like? What feels like an optimum class size, do you think? Mm. So it depends. So it depends on the on, on a number of uh, of factors. Uh, first, it depends on the uh, tech abilities of uh, the students and of course the teacher. It also depends on the level. So the lower the level in terms of COBs or English proficiency, the less the number of students should be because the teacher needs to support them. So for higher levels, I think maximum should be 18, ideal maybe 12. Um, so yeah, so it depends on other factors. So maybe when we talk about uh, interaction as well, uh, people think it's always the teacher who is delivering and the students are only listening to the teacher for the whole time. Microsoft Teams and Zoom, they have uh, breakout rooms or breakout sessions where teachers can put the students into smaller groups, into more manageable groups. For example, uh, teachers may decide to put uh, students or learners into groups of threes for example, and the teacher can visit uh, the different rooms, join the rooms, interact with the students, uh, regroup or recreate the room so that students can interact with the different uh, class members. So, so there are different ways of you know, making sure that the interaction goes on and making sure that the groups are manageable. For example, the teacher can present information and then when the teacher wants the students to discuss in smaller groups so that everybody has a chance to participate, everybody has a chance to speak, the teacher can put the students into these breakout rooms and then you know, join one breakout room, move to another breakout room. So in terms of ideal numbers, like I said, I think the rule of thumb is the higher the level, the more students you could have in a class and the lower the level, the less students you should have. If it, it's, it's true for the face-to-face -face as well. We know that for the lower levels, the numbers, the maximum and ideal numbers, they're lower in, in, compared to the higher levels. We have less students in a low level class compared to a high level class. So I think the same rule or the, the same principle applies because the lower levels, they need more support. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Callisto. Um, I am cognizant of the time and we've been putting you on the spot a lot, Callisto. I wonder if I could move to Shay. Shay, you've been asked particularly uh, in the chat. Uh, could you please share some examples of how you managed to ensure staff work-life balance? Sure. Um, I'll keep it as, as short as possible since we're running out of time, but um, simply put, it would be to really provide a listening, a good listening ear um, 
especially uh, when people are, they have different situations at home that we had to take into consideration if they were caregiving uh, for children or homeschooling children, or if they were looking after um, elderly folks at home, uh, or if uh, they themselves were affected by uh, COVID-19 um, or a household member was infected. So having very, very uh, close um, uh, communication on a regular basis. Uh, some examples could be uh, we're creating a, a group uh, a chat account uh, using uh, WhatsApp or other other types of applications to check in every morning and uh, share information about uh, different things to help help folks at home uh, to help uh, cope. Um, we did that regularly on a daily basis, for example. Um, and um, just maybe taking it offline and talking to individuals on the phone and on video as much as possible if they were encountering uh, very personal challenges and they didn't want to share with anyone, it was very confidential to uh, respect that. And also having, um, letting uh, staff members know to keep to a schedule um, so that, uh, you know, as employers, as supervisors, especially not to contact them outside of those uh, working hours that they were working, whether they were part-time workers or full-time workers and working on the weekends or evenings to respect their time um, and not constantly con be contacting them because being virtual, it's, it becomes uh, a little bit too easy to contact and connect with people too much. Um, so yeah, those are some examples and I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, Shay. Uh, Peggy, did you want to add to that at all? Can we move on? Um, I have a, a really um, interesting question here I noticed. Um, when it comes to uh, practicum students, Callisto, uh, I will ask you again, um, what are the implications of involving them under the circumstances of the pandemic and moving forward. Thank you for that question. Yes, that that that's a that's a uh, a question that we have faced, and uh, I think some other language training organizations they faced a similar question or situation. Uh, we have always supported um, uh, practicum students because some of our teachers, first of all, they came to success as practicum practicum students, and then they ended up working for us. And we, we value practicum students. Uh, so I would say two things about this. The first one, I mentioned it. I think uh, colleges and universities that offer ESO training, they need to build online teaching skills into their curriculum. That's, that's important. And then the second one is what we did is we got in touch with the, um, the administrators or the coordinators of our ESO programs, and we kind of told them the platforms that we're using, the Moodle, uh, Zoom, so that they prepared their students before they came to success. Because we found out that it was better for us to let the administrators know the type of technology that we were using and the type of technology that the practicum students would encounter when they came to success. That way they came a little bit more prepared. Of course, they needed support from the teachers and from the administrators as well, but they were a little bit more prepared because the administrators or the college, they kind of offered them a boot camp, for example, on Zoom. If they'd never taught on Zoom, they had no idea how to navigate Zoom, they were offered a bootcamp before they came to success. Moodle, for example, they would be offered uh, some training on how to navigate Moodle because we didn't require them to create content on Moodle. We have content on Moodle, but they had to be able to navigate the Moodle, how to show, how to hide, uh, possibly maybe how to, nav how to move uh, content from or an activity, depending on where they would like to uh, place the activity. So we found it really helpful to coordinate with the, uh, the program coordinators. 
Thank you so much, Callisto. Uh, I believe uh, we've gone over time. My apologies uh, to uh, our organizers. Uh, before we close and, and uh, it gets shut down, uh, Peggy, was there anything further that you'd like to share? Peggy rests and Shay rests. Yes. <laughs> and Callisto rests for now. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, uh, Peggy, Shay, and Callisto, uh, for uh, joining us today. Um, everybody on the line, I'm sure, uh, has uh, very, very uh, uh, interesting challenges ahead. And um, uh, we by no means uh, are, are the experts. We came here today to share with you our observations as we are all in this together in the settlement sector, uh, finding our way. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. A big thank you to our P2P workshop organizers. It's been quite uh, a wonderful experience since last fall, uh, attending an amazing conference, uh, still thinking of the wonderful uh, uh, keynote by uh, uh, some of the presenters. And um, uh, I believe it was Dr. Stuart Taylor, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't wanna get his name um, uh, wrong, but if you haven't heard that keynote, please listen to it. It is amazing. Um, and January, February, March, April, uh, P2P has been uh, providing us with an amazing opportunity to listen to our colleagues across Canada, and it's been an amazing experience. Thank you so much uh, to uh, the P2P organizers, and in particular, uh, Sonali Advani, who's been so lovely and supporting us today. Uh, I believe we can uh, say farewell. Thank you, everybody.